pageants are back. I don't think they ever went away. They might have taken a back seat in New Zealand. They're still big business. Miss World is viewed by a television audience worldwide of of over a billion. It's bigger than the Super Bowl. It is a big business and it's a big deal. There will always be controversy. The Miss Fiji pageant has turned ugly with allegations of corruption in the voting process and the winner stripped of her crown. Yeah, that was just a really a bit unheard of that there was an absentee judge all of a sudden and now all of a sudden there was a tie, they were the tiebreaker and this other girl wins and they took the crown away from the girl who won fairly that night. Do you believe that there was some level of, of corruption here? Uh, yes, I do. But they're not what they used to be, thank goodness. In the competition of swimsuits with Costa Rica. This gorgeous girl enjoys riding motorcycles and, get this, four-wheelers with her brother. She even used to own her own bike. Pretty cool. This year, climate activist Brianna Fruin entered Miss Samoa to use the contest as a platform. She was runner-up. I really saw the opportunity for the Miss Samoa to be more than just a figure, be more than just someone we see, but someone we hear. Dr Deborah Lambie won Miss World New Zealand in 2015. Now she's 33 and the first ever pregnant Miss Universe contestant. Last year when I saw that Miss Universe was changing their rules, so removing the age limit, removing the rule that said that women who had had babies couldn't do it, removing the rule that said that if you're pregnant you can't do the competition. I thought, wow, that's really cool and like a real step forward. And while Miss Universe still has the high-heeled swimsuit parade, Miss World certainly does not. Nigel Godfrey, the man who runs Miss World in New Zealand, was firmly behind that move. Because I didn't think that um, bikinis on the stage were particularly appropriate in this world and, and I didn't think it was what, what a New Zealand audience would want to see. Kia ora, I'm Alexia Russell. I'm five foot nine inches tall. I have blue eyes and brown hair and I produce the Detail podcast. Today, a new era in pageantry where instead of activists throwing flower bombs at the stage, they're on the stage taking part in the competition. I definitely feel like there's a new wave, a new era of pageantry happening in not only Samoa, but in the Pacific. I feel like our region, we're being faced at the moment with multiple crises. It's trying times in our islands. The issues are stacking up, and therefore I feel like we need to be more creative in the ways that we move our communities. Nigel Godfrey welcomes contestants who want to tell the world about their causes, like Brianna Fruin. I'd like to get more of that. So you might be surprised that there's no stipulations around body shape or, or anything in Miss Universe. There are others. I mean, that I've I've heard of competitions where they say, no, you can't send her, she's too ugly. You know, I mean, that's ridiculous. But that's not the case with Miss Universe, not the case with Miss World. And those are the two that I, you know, that I hold um, uh, a place to. I would like to see someone who had a, perhaps a, a, a physical disability enter. I've never have had. There's nothing stopping them. And I would entertain that entry, entry just like anyone else. I really would just like to see more diversity because it's not, it's about the person. It's beauty with a purpose is the Miss World mantra. Um, and where that beauty comes from, it's not just, it's not standing on stage. I, you know, if you looked at the contestants that we've had in the in the years I've run competitions and then the international competitions and you just looked at the photos and said, well, she's going to win because she's gorgeous, she's beautiful, whatever, you'd always get it wrong. Beauty competitions are still a huge deal in Asia, particularly in the Philippines and Thailand. But interest in New Zealand has fallen off dramatically since the peak of the 1980s when TVNZ screened the finals and drew huge audiences. Tonight, live from the four corners of the earth, eight in the world. First runner-up is Miss USA. Miss New Zealand is Miss Universe. Congratulations, Miss New Zealand.
1983, 700 million people watched Lorraine Downs being crowned Miss Universe in what is still the only time New Zealand has won an international beauty pageant. It was big hair, gorgeous gowns, slightly creepy MCs, and yes, togs and high heels. When I went to the international competitions, I used to get bowled up by, you know, the Puerto Rican director. You're the man who took uh, uh, bikinis off the stage. What the hell are you doing? And I said, well, in our country, we'd have a riot if you do that. And I said, well, OK, it's not in your country. And just respect what so we went, do in New Zealand. So that went down quite well here. It went down very well here. And I think it was the right thing to do. You want to see girls in scantily clad bikinis I'm sure there are venues that you can go and see them but they don't involve responsible young women in a competition that's all about fellowship That's really interesting because you would think that the cliche of a beauty pageant owner would be, oh, get to see a few girls Well I'm going to be controversial here and tell you a story about Miss World the, uh, the actual Miss World competition and, and Dame Julia Morley who's a great friend of mine um, way back way back in the 1980s she suggested that she wanted to get rid of the swimwear from the stage I won't say who it was who told her look Julia this is a competition it's all about T and A I'm sure you can guess Mm -hmm. what T and A so we're not doing that but it certainly wasn't the Miss World organisation they wanted to go down that road but then things were controlled by television Television looked at it and said, if we don't have young women in bikinis, we ain't going to get ratings. So they were put in their place but by, you know, a stakeholder, which was a television organisation. But there's not, I mean, we haven't seen beauty pageants here on TV for a while. We have, actually, because when I took it back over in 2013, we went we went um, on to Juice TV um, with a full outside broadcast. And then for the following years, um, for two years, I was on Bravo. And it was a full OB with all the same team because I work in television, so I brought the same team in to do it. Um, And then after that, I just decided, well, we can get the same audience streaming. And so we got extraordinary audiences streaming, you know, in excess of 50,000 people watching the show. Well, what what made you want to be the puppeteer here? (laughs) (laughs) Be the puppeteer. Well, I guess um, I'll explain how it happened in New Zealand and then maybe explain how I first got into it. But in New Zealand in 2012, there was, a uh, again, a bit of a controversy over um, Miss Universe. And I saw it on social media. And I got a background around beauty pageants. And I just wrote on the, the people who were putting this forward, this controversy forward. I wrote, look... Love it or hate it, if you're going to do this competition, for God's sake, get it right. Because these sorts of stories have a habit of being picked up worldwide and we just look, as a country, stupid. What was the controversy? Uh, It was a judging controversy. It was a South African girl who'd won who didn't have residency, so they'd stripped her of the title. And it was all a mess around the judging and whether it was fixed and all those things. Um, The reaction to my comment on that social media post was from one person in particular, um, who became my business partner. Um, Well, you organise big television shows, because I do. Why don't you do it? To which I replied, all right, then I will. (laughs) And that was it. We put in a proposal to the Miss Universe organisation in New York. Um, We took the franchise off the person who had it at the time. And then we, we did it, ran it for seven years. And what made you want to switch to Miss World, just because of this philosophical difference? Yeah, I, I, my history goes back to Miss World back in the 80s. And I wasn't happy with Miss Universe. I, they could never shrug Trump. So when Trump... I was in New York in the Miss Universe office when he made his rapist speech. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some... I assume are good people. And I've never been in a uh, in an office where I've seen 60 people go nuts. I mean, it was just like, ah, because immediately NBC pulled out. Within, within days, NBC pulled out. They forced him to sell. And the bottom line is that they, even though he sold his interest entirely at that point to IMG, which I thought was going to be incredibly positive because they have Fashion Week, the management of Miss Universe never changed. So all the people that Trump 
had put in place and all the people who worked for they stayed. And so I thought, well, nothing's going to change. And you couldn't shrug Trump. You just, you can't, he's toxic. I've, I've met the man. He's, I met him in Moscow. You, you can't shrug him. And, and so for years, I just thought, oh, you know, this is not going the way I want it. The competition that we were doing locally and nationally wasn't what they were doing internationally. My contestants would go there and say, oh, they want me to wear this bikini and it's tiny and and I'd got a connection with Miss World going 40 years back and um, I didn't think we could get the franchise and I flew to London um, at the beginning of uh, 2020 met with Julia Morley and um, she and her team <laughs> stopped me halfway through my presentation and said we've been watching you and I, we wondered why you weren't coming to see us so Yes. So when people decide they want to enter a, a beauty contest now, say yours, say Miss World, what are the criteria? Because they won't be the same criteria as they were 20 years ago. No, they're not. And I think what you have to do is you, you've got to look. It, it's on the um, contestant to really look. And unfortunately, the ages of the contestants, it precludes them from being perhaps that uh, being able to look at something and go, oh, is this right? Is this right? You know, we'll get some perspective. Yes, some perspective and some context. So you really need to look at what the competition is offering and perhaps what you can bring to the competition. Some competitions are just they run at a very superficial level. It's, you know, put on a pretty dress, come to our competition, you know, get some social media coverage and that's going to be it. Others, it's far more of a journey. Miss World still has age limits, 16 to 27. Miss Universe just has a starting age of 18, and that's it. So I'm not sure how many uh, elderly uh, contestants you will see in Miss Universe. You might see them stretch the limits. Well, we've got this one from New Zealand doctor, Deborah Lambie, 33, yep. and pregnant. I realised that all I was doing was ruling myself out and that no one else was ruling me out. Um, and so that gave me a lot to think about. And I really put it as a challenge to myself to show myself that I can do it. Now, she's Miss Universe, not Miss World, so she's not one of yours. Well, she was. Oh, was she? <laughs> she was in our first competition um, back in 2013. She's a lovely lady. And she, um, she's very competitive, I'll say that. Uh, she then went on to Miss World. And she won Miss World New Zealand. I will say that Deborah, when we flew back from Thailand, because I took all the contestants to Thailand, um, she made headline news because I spotted that someone across the aisle was was basically dying. And uh, there was the famous, you know, is, is there a doctor on the plane? And she stepped up and um, saved his life. I, we, I've stayed friends with that gentleman in um, Whangarei ever since. Oh, wow. So she, she's a great young woman. The parameters obviously are changing by the day, expanding. What is that a reflection of? I think it's a changing world. Um, you, know, you know, Miss being the... I mean, you've got to remember this competition. These competitions were started in, 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 in Britain in 1951. Um, it was a bikini competition originally, Miss World was, um, for the Festival of Britain. Uh, it was to bring countries together for the Festival of Britain, which was like an expo. But they've de developed over the world, and countries have developed over the years. One thing I think is good to focus on is that some countries have developed, some haven't. You go to Asia, you go to Thailand, you go to the Philippines, they are still in the same zone that we were in the 80s. And that's very difficult to counter. It's very difficult to explain to them that, well, our, our women like to be equal. Our women don't want to be seen in this way. It, it's a very difficult thing to counter, especially when you're then bringing all of those world people together to have one competition. So they tend to be the more traditional... Oh, very. ...misogynistic, very. if you like. Well, I, I, I don't think I'd use the word misogynistic because they all love it and they have amazing respect for the contestants. We took our contestants for Miss Universe New Zealand when I ran it to both Thailand and the Philippines and stayed in five-star hotels, were given security, had most extraordinary experiences and they were just in awe of our contestants. They just have a different way of expressing their respect. It's not a, it's not, you know, it's not ogling. It's not um, 
you know, calling it, oh, all right, oh, you love. It's not nothing to do with that. You're, you're given an extraordinary respect and put on a pedestal. It's not a pedestal that we would want here because we don't want to worship people just because they're good looking, just because they're attractive in a, in a, in a, in a you know, a, a general sense of the word. Um, but it, but it is still something that exists in other parts of the world. And you don't even have to be a miss sometimes, it appears. You can be married. Again, um, different competitions have different rules. You do in Miss World. It's, you're not married. You're not in a relationship. You're not pregnant. I mean, one point I would make about the not being pregnant or not having children, you are expected uh, for either Miss Universe or Miss World to then go and live in either New York or in uh, London because you've got an awful lot to do in that year of that, the that's year if you of win. your as if you win. Well, you, and, and I think when you send a representative, you have to think, what if she wins? You can't just go, hey, go along for the ride. Um, and you couldn't do that with a child. You, you couldn't live in a flat and be out every night at, 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 at functions and be flying all over the world. And that's what you do. It's a it's a serious job. And I mean, you know, when you say you, you expect to win. New Zealand has never won except for once. Lorraine Downs, yeah, mm. Lorraine Downs won. Well, yeah, yeah, I've been to those international finals uh, many times, and you know there are now over a hundred incredibly talented young women standing on the stage, being for being judged for whatever want of a better word. I would hate to be anywhere near that judging. How would you make those choices? We sent a representative to Miss World this year who I think was the best representative in, in any competition that I have ever been involved with that we sent. My name is Navjot Kaur. I'm 27 years old. I was born here, um, born in Manurua. I did a degree from the University of Auckland, um, became a police officer, served as a constable in Ormiston, um, and then I did personal training. She came in the top 40, which was a very big achievement for New Zealand, but she didn't win. What were her special qualities? Uh, a societal understanding. She'd been a police officer and she she just got the world. She got problems. She got, you know, how how people struggle and how they work to get out of that struggle. I was born in a um, and grew up in a state house. Um, what I saw around me when, from a very young age was something that you don't see um, too close up if you're living in different areas. And I did see young people, young kids not getting food. She empathised with everyone. Every contestant during the, the short journey that we had together just fell in love with her. They just thought she was like the mother of the, you know, she was just great. And she made an impact. She made a real impact. I've since spoken to the uh, Miss World organisation and she made it a, quite an impact over there in India too. Um, but again, she's she's incredibly relatable and she's in it for all the right reasons. And the right reasons... So how, how do you know that? Like, are, is every single contestant interviewed? Do mm. they have to... Balance a ball on the end of the nose these days, or do what are they? How do they showcase their skills and their interests? Well, the big thing is the interview. So uh, yes, they do. You know, they do dance, and they're observed during doing dance. They're observed doing catwalk. Um, and uh, as we go on this year, we're we're going to have athletics involved and um, fitness involved, um, and also their entrepreneurial skills because there's a major money raising charity money raising aspect to the competitions that I run but the big deal is an interview uh, is the interview with the judges it's about 20 minutes long there are six judges um, not I'm not a judge I was chairing the panel but I'm not a judge and uh, they're they're drilled they're, they're quizzed hard and and what the judges seek to find out is what they will bring to a competition or you know what they can add to the competition and what they will what they understand about being part of the Miss World organization for us. And I guess if these people are then becoming an ambassador of Miss World if they if they win the competition they have certain requirements that they can't be a dummy with blonde hair. Well, I, yeah, I think you know, it's not big. I don't I, I make no bones about it. It's not big here in New Zealand, but 
you, you know, when you go overseas, it's a big deal. As I said, a billion people watch it on television. As you see, you said you you picked up a an Indian television piece. And a sports challenge was organized in New Delhi's National Stadium as part of the Miss World pageant on Saturday, and all the contestants enjoyed the sports activities. Miss New Zealand Navjot Kaur is a die-hard Virat Kohli fan. In an exclusive interview with DD India correspondent Suchitra Bhadratwaj, Miss New Zealand said that India and New Zealand have many things in common with the love for cricket being one of them. And that is representing New Zealand, whether you like it or not. You know, it's like a sports star being interviewed after a game. That represents New Zealand and, and what they say matters. Now, if if me as an organiser or other organisers take that seriously and feel, well, hang on, we're actually representing something here, then you do want to get that right. And there have been a number of organisers over the years who've got it entirely and utterly wrong. I care about New Zealand. I care how we look overseas. And I don't want to get it wrong. When people approach you and say, can I enter your competition? Mm. What sort of people are they? What motivates them to do that? I think, you know, that I, ca I can't say they're one type or they're one another type. What my first conversation is always have a look at our website and look at the journey and see if it's for you and I think that's really important because it's not for everyone because there's a big commitment in our competition we've raised two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for charity since I've been involved I'm pleased with that it makes me I've worked in television for 40 years you know I'm giving something back. It's, it's it's important to me to do something. And it's important to the, for me to have those contestants feel they've done something. And I can tell you that we've had 140 contestants through the competitions I've run between 2013 and 19. So many of them have done better in their worlds and better in their jobs, better in their lives through the experience they had you know they had this massive uh, trip overseas staying in places they would never have dreamt of they were challenged to do what we describe as an entrepreneurial challenge where we mentor them i ran the entrepreneur of the year for 15 years along with ey um and so i know a bit about entrepreneurial competitions and so we i would challenge them to create something run an event run a high tea, run a fashion show, whatever, raise money for charity. And then we would introduce them to those charities and they would see where the money was going. And it turned them around because they realised that in their little world that they were just jollying along to put on a pretty dress and all their mates go, oh, don't you look lovely? There's a lot more to it. That's all for today. The Detail is a newsroom production supported by RNZ and NZ On Air. This episode was engineered by Jeremy Ansell and produced by Gwen McClure. Thanks to Nigel Godfrey. I'm Alexia Russell. Thanks for listening. <laughs>